Our second panel, as you can see, is behind closed doors of the PhD Defense, because it's a room um, that hopefully you don't see the inside of too much uh, when you are defending, um, unless you end up doing many PhDs, and good on you if you do do that. Um, we're, we're lucky enough to have uh, two professors in the department here to tell us about what goes on, um, and also a recent graduate. Um, who uh, they're just gonna talk about their experiences. Um, and as of the first panel, we're gonna have each person speak for 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So if you have any questions, save them up for the end. Um, first, we have Dr. Sandra Denonor, um, whose own PhD defense was at Oxford. She served as grad chair in the department and is also currently an associate professor. In addition to her current role as the associate dean in the School of Graduate Studies, she supervised many students in the department and served on many committees here at Queen's and will be addressing some of the nuts and bolts of the PhD defense, because um, again, we don't really know what goes on there. Um, <laughs> at the end here, we have Dr. Jane Arrington, who earned her PhD here at Queen's and who is also a professor in the department. She's also helped uh, many students in providing guidance through their PhD defense, both as supervisor and committee member. Um, she's also previously Dean of Arts at RMC. Uh, and she's gonna give us some insight into what happens inside the actual room itself. And then finally, we have Dr. Riju Ray. Um, <laughs> Um, who recently went behind closed doors at her own defense uh, not too long ago after graduating here at Queens. And so she's just gonna walk us through her own personal experience and what she went through. So, Dr. Denotter. Okay, thank you. And thanks for the invitation. So, I, in the invitation, um, we were invited to recall and recollect oh, uh, in the dim past, dim and distant past in my case, um, my, my own PhD defense. Um, so I'll start off by saying that uh, I went into that with all sorts of apocryphal narratives about failure and how many people failed and how <laughs> failure was a default and it really felt like I was going into a situation in which um, it would be a very uncertain income outcome and after my defense I said to my supervisor, oh, no, I'm so anxious about that and I'm not, as you know, generally a very anxious person but she said, oh, there was never any question in my mind. <laughs> so um, I think that this is um, something that I've learned that I tried to take into my uh, supervision is that when somebody goes up to defense, I say, you are ready for defense. This is a really strong thesis. And uh, you know, these might be a few areas of potential um, questioning or areas in which the work in its post-PhD um, state might be strengthened, but if it's good to go, it's good to go. And I think that that, that, um, it, that can be helpful. So if your supervisor doesn't give you this automatically, um, try to elicit it or ask. <laughs> that, do you think it'll be OK? <laughs> I wish I had done that. Um, my defense is also highly formal. We had to wear subfusk, so black gowns and carry the mortarboard. And, um, and the, th the supervisor is not present at a defense at Oxford, so it's just the internal examiner and an external examiner. And the role of the uh, supervisor at a defense is there to um, interject, or at the time when the supervisor's turn comes to ask questions, to remind examiners of things that they may have forgotten. Usually this doesn't happen, but to say, well, the scope of this project was limited by you know, the four to six years that a PhD in history typically takes and so yes it would be lovely if the student had consulted archives in this other um, country but beyond the scope of the thesis. So it is really nice to have the supervisor at your defense and they do play a really constructive role there I think. Um, but like anyone who goes through a defense the feeling of relief afterwards is, is really wonderful. So, and, and a third thing I would say, I think, is that it is an excellent opportunity to have a conversation with experts in your field. In my case, there were two preeminent um, historians, um, Peter, you'd recognize their names, uh, Michael Frieden and Peter Clark, so it was a wonderful opportunity and, uh, and I did really enjoy that. It, even though I didn't know what the outcome would be, I was uncertain about it, um, I really did, did enjoy that. So um, I'm going to give you a few um, bits of information that I think would be useful for you to know. And I'm, I'm doing it both with one foot in the history department and one foot in the School of Graduate Studies. 
So as you know, uh, the School of Graduate Studies oversees the setup um, and the conduct of PhD defenses, so it might be, and might be useful for you too to have a sense of the landscape beyond history and across the, the many disciplines that um, defend theses annually. Okay, so there um, on the School of Graduate Studies website, Rose Silva, who's a thesis coordinator, has some really lovely information pages up there that she divides into stage one, stage two, stage three, and I think these slides will be circulated to you afterwards if you want. Um, and I'll put in, I'll embed some web links. But for those of you who are not at the penultimate stages of your thesis, it may be useful for you to keep in mind that there is something called a thesis template, so that if you're starting to write, you can use the template that does all this wonderful formatting for you. It generates um, table of contents automatically. If you're already writing, just abandon that that idea because it, you can't just lift and dump into this template. It's only if you're at the beginning stages of writing that you can start using that template. So I just mention it in case there's anyone here at the early stages of writing. If you're not, um, then disregard that. Uh, for those of you who are um, t moving towards the end, then the, the primary resource for you is this thing called general form for theses. And it's, I'm not going to talk about that. It's very boring, it's huge, and it has all sorts of things like margins, pagination, like little things like the introduction, you can't call an introduction unless you yeah. say chapter one, yeah. colon, introduction. Makes no sense. And right. it has to start on page one. I know. And there's utter inflexibility about this. So you don't want to delay anything. You don't, and apparently I asked, historians are very good, physicists are very bad, <laughs> but um, generally, for whatever reason, historians are, are formatting um, their theses appropriately. So just keep that in mind, that it's better to start thinking about the general format that everything appears in now, not you know, on day 26 before you're going to submit, um, 26 days before you plan to submit. Okay, um, also if you have material that you have um, that need to ask for copyright, that is something too to think of in advance. So if you're accessing copyrighted information, there's somebody at the library now, his name is Mark Swartz, and he is like the copyright guru. So if you have any copyright questions, just send him an email and he'll get back to you. And also to know that there are all sorts of supports in the writing stage, the final stages of writing. I know that um, many of you have attended either the SGS um, dissertation writing boot camp or the one that um, some of you have put together in the history department. And that can be a great resource in the final um, stages of writing up. Okay, so then in terms of the actual submission of the document, say you have this thing that is, is ready to be defended. The other important thing I just alert you to is that it takes quite a while from the time that you submit it to the time that your defense is held. It's a minimum of 25 working days. So when you're planning the date of your defense, you have to count back 25 days. I remember doing that. Like you just, and it's yeah, quite six scary, weeks. right? It, it's, it's, it's literally six weeks. And we have some degree of fungibility. Rose probably wouldn't want me saying this in a public forum, but like, we, can, we can have a few days um, latitude if there are, are, are extenuating circumstances. I do want to emphasize that that's a minimum, right? The 25 days, working days is a minimum. But what we're really trying to do at the School of Graduate Studies is prevent that getting a lot longer than 25 days. So sometimes, students are continuing to pay tuition for the time that they're waiting to defend their thesis, and if there's a problem with scheduling the examiners, it has absolutely nothing to do with you. You, meanwhile, are paying your tuition fees for all that time. So if you find that the scheduling is taking a long time or that the date seems really remote, it is totally within your right, I think, and it would be a good idea to talk to your supervisor and say, eh, can't we do anything else about this? If, if it's um, somebody, for example, who has a tiny little window of being able to travel to Kingston, that's usually the case of the, in the external examiner, it is possible to bring your external examiner in by Skype. I myself don't think that Skype defenses work nearly as well as, I mean, they work fine. It's not a question of their, um, they're functioning, but it's not as an immediate an experience as if your external examiner can be in the room. 
but if it means waiting an additional month for your external examiner to actually be in attendance in a physical embodiment, then you might want to consider whether, um, whether it's worth waiting or maybe looking at another examiner. So just so you know that it is very much on the School of Graduate Studies radar that students are paying tuition for that, that period of time and we'll do all that we can expedite. Local situations are always best though, so ideally that could be f fixed up locally. Okay, so the point being that it's a minimum of 25 working days, so it's useful to do that when you're at the stage of the maybe second penultimate draft of your thesis to start trying to think about dates and then it really does help you to, to put yourself on a really tight schedule for the final production of, of those chapters in that copy. So um, two more boring things about forms. There is this form that has to go to the School of Graduate Studies that puts your defense in the lineup um, for it to be scheduled. Yvonne looks after that, like she goes around and makes sure that signatures happen. But just so you know that such a form exists and um, I don't know if you sign it. Did you, did you have to sign a form? You have, you have to declare mm -hmm. whether you are going to have an open or closed exam on that on form. That form. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think you sign, but you actually do have to. So there are bits that you've got to know what you want to do. So an open defense is when you can invite people into the defense. They wouldn't be there for the time that the examiners talk about the thesis, either the beginning or the end, but they are there for the defense. They're pretty uncommon in history. I think I've only been, and education has more. Um, I've been at three in history here. Yeah. Of How did you find them? They're very. It, it, what happens is that they, um, and I, if you want, I can talk about it there. Here, um, they. It, it works on the basis that they will come in um, often for, and, and it was set up quite consciously because people then said, "I would like to do a formal presentation at the beginning," right? And but they are not necessarily there for the formal questioning. Um, many schools and. You don't need to know this, but many schools, including RMC, for example, would automatically make them open at the beginning. So everybody does a 20-minute presentation when they're defending their thesis, and then the, the spectators or the <laughs> folks who are going go and go from there. Um, I've had t of those three, two of them, the people stayed throughout for the questioning and were in fact encouraged to ask questions themselves. Um, it makes the process. I mean, it was very interesting. One of them, it was brilliant. It worked really, really well. Um, in the other, it was not. It wasn't bad, but it was just a sort of non. It just was an interruption, right? Rather, rather than, rather than it becoming a conversation, which is what I think you and the and I'll talk about that. What I think you want, uh, it became a sort of. People would ask questions, and the the audience said there were five in the audience who said yes, but you know, and you want to go. No, it's not the time. It's not the time. Yeah. Now, those were not my students. Um, I was part of the examining board. I was on, on the examining committee, um, i.e. the thesis committee. But it was just a, it's an interesting experience. I think you have to think about it hard if you want to open it. And don't invite children, because that has <laughs> happened. Well, don't invite children and do not invite. In one of these, it was someone who invited, in fact, folks. This was people, somebody who'd done work on basis of a lot of it, research on, with oral testimony and invited two of the people who were actually had given oral testimony that were in the thesis. That's so bad, <laughs> And it was just, that was the one where there was just interruption, yeah. right? Because they had also read the thesis, understandably, that was part of the condition of doing the oral interviews, but it did create um, some difficulties, yeah. right? It just did, it, it interrupted what we were doing, and it was very, I mean, it was an interesting object lesson on how memory and history and are different and how they get shaped and then how the third party, i.e. the author, then shapes that and puts that into context. But it was, yeah, that, that wasn't the forum to do it in. It would have been a very interesting forum to have done it on its own with a presentation and then folks who actually had participated without then the, the pressure that can come with a, a defense. So, yeah, anyway. The open defenses I've been at have primarily been family supporters or friends attend. And the question, I think, does arise is does that 
kind of distract you? Could it destabilize your focus? Because in a thesis defense, you have to be kind of so focused over a period of time. So, um, yeah. So that form um, does need to be completed and the 25-day the, the count cannot happen until that form is submitted and in place, so it's a kind of important one. There's also some other forms that you need to sign and bring to the defense with you, library forms um, and the like, and they'll all be circulated to you in advance. You don't have to worry about finding those forms, just remember to bring them. So um, I, I wanted just to talk a little bit about the composition of the examining committee, who's on an examining committee, because that might not be clear to all of you. And let, just let, let, I don't know, is anyone here doing a master's thesis dissertation? We don't have many of them anymore, so I assume you're all thinking about this at the doctoral level. Okay, so there's a chairperson who is responsible for collecting the reports, reading the reports, managing the whole conversation. That will not be a historian. It's usually somebody from a cognate department, or in the case of history, somebody from anywhere in the university who's just really keen on history and likes attending um, history PhDs, and there's a, a large number of them. Um, so the one at the defense that I was at a couple days ago uh, was somebody who was not a historian, but whose husband had grown up in a colonial African country and her in-laws were colonial officials and she's just really interested to find out what historians are saying about their limitations. It was a very interesting um, reason to be a chair of a defense. But this, this appointment is made by the School of Grad Studies so you don't need to worry about that and, and that person is just there to make sure that there's due process, that questioning is fair, that it takes place within an allotted period of time which for external examiners is about 25 minutes and for internal examiners about 20 minutes. So they're a timekeeper, they manage the flow of the defense, they manage the discussion of the results at the end and I'll say something about that later. There's also the head of the department or the delegate. So usually it's somebody, another member of the history faculty, it's usually not the chair but um, some other person who isn't directly in your field but might have um, ancillary interests to your field. Then there's a supervisor or supervisors, at least one other member of the department, and that's called the internal examiner, internal, internal. And that person is usually pretty close in your field. So if you're a Canadianist, it would be another Canadianist. If it, you're a British scholar, it probably would be another <coughs> British scholar. Or it could be in a, co a cognate discipline. So if you do gender theory, it might be another gender historian. So somebody who's, who's closer to the field of research. All right, before you go any farther, most often, most often in history, those are people who are part of your dissertation committee. Those two are part of your dissertation committee. You will actually know who they are in advance. Um, you will have worked with them. They will have seen various bits of your thesis. So these are not new. This is one of the things that came in whenever we brought in those new. So that, um, you know, the heads delegate. So we, I, for example, for one of my students, there are two other people on the, on the thesis committee. One of them will be designated as and we, I hate to say it, we actually do see just flip a coin. One is delegated as the, head, as the head's delegate and the other is the internal member of the committee. Right? So they're familiar to you. Yeah. And then there's the external, um, internal, so somebody who is in another Queen's department. Um, now, that can be very hit and miss. Sometimes it's somebody who knows a lot about your area and can really contribute, and sometimes it's less felicitous. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. A good um, internal external examiner will say at the beginning, I'm not a historian and tell me if my questions are out of line or I'm coming from a weird perspective. Um, because that can sometimes happen. It could be an unnerving experience for um, a student being examined if they get questions that come from a very different methodological background and assume a very different set of literature or scholarship. But I, I've never been in a defense in which that was a problem, but that wasn't articulated by the examiner. It will say, tell me if this question seems to be coming out of left field. It's a really um, great opportunity to know how your work links with other disciplines and to make bridges to other disciplines, especially in the refinement of the work for publication afterwards. It's a great opportunity to speak outside your more narrow um, area and then the external examiner who comes from outside Queen's University. 
and maybe the other people will talk. I won't talk a lot about um, that. What I will say, because Jay, maybe you can talk about how one goes about um, identifying an external examiner, the composition of this entire committee is something that you discuss with your supervisor or supervisors. So in the final analysis, it is a decision made by the supervisor that has to be ratified by the grad coordinator, and then the School of Grad Studies gets involved too, because if somebody doesn't have a permanent appointment at Queen's, I can't sit on this defense, yeah, and then we sometimes have to create a quick adjunct appointment for you, them. You so don't they worry can. about that. <laughs> you don't worry about that. That's so not your issue. What, you're, what the conversation that happens is um, that you, you early on start talking about this with your supervisor. So it's a very symbiotic process. Um, in which the student really does have a big voice. But the supervisor does have, have experience inside and outside the university, so it's really important to allow that voice to be paramount because they speak from experience and knowledge of, of other people. So, okay. So then the scheduling of the defense. This is the responsibility of the supervisor to do. So you shouldn't feel that you need to go around tracking down members of your committee. It does happen and it upsets me when it happens because I think it's really unfair to the student to be asking, um, <laughs> asking people to sit on their defense for starters should never happen. And then no. getting out calendars and trying to mastermind this all. Um, I'm sure that no one in history would ever ask a student to do that. It happens surprisingly frequently across the university. But if that did happen, you could just say, would you mind doing that? I'd feel more comfortable. Okay. And so then, so then once you have your committee, that goes on that form that Yvonne has, and it goes in, and um, there is a checklist that is up on Rose Silva's website. Um, and just be really careful about that checklist. Make sure that you read it really carefully, and if you check something off, make sure that you actually have done that. Just, it just goes to the point of delays. You don't want to delay this dissertation any longer than it um, needs to. So then your examiners have about six weeks to read the thesis. Um, we're in a kind of state of transition where some people like to have the hard copy and some people like to have it in an electronic version. It is totally fine for you to ask your committee, once that's all been put in place, whether they prefer electronic copy or printed copy. Printed copy is like, it's expensive, right, mm -hmm. to print off a, a big, big thesis. And so that is an option. Some universities, U University of Toronto has gone over completely to electronic copies and no longer does printed copies. So do check with your committee before you, but you do have to run off at least one for, um, for the School of Grad Studies. And if, and you want to word the email so that if somebody who likes to mark up a hard copy, that they don't feel that they're being a pain to ask you for a hard copy. So be very careful in the wording of, of that email because a lot of people prefer to have the hard copy. And don't bind it. For some, for, because folks like me will just unbind it when they're reading it. I'm serious. Do not bind it. Do not bind it. Do not bind it for the grad school. Don't bind it for your committee members. You just are giving them, you know, an envelope with. Yeah. You you won't even be able to get a paper clip around it of any kind. Maybe yeah. 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 An envelope. An envelope. An envelope. Yeah. yeah. An envelope. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so then they go away and, and read this, this document, and then they will write a report. They'll get a reminder that they need to write a report. The report, at minimum, asks them whether the thesis is ready to go forward to defense. Is the thesis ready to go forward to defense? So, unless there are really significant problems with the dissertation, the thesis will go forward to defense. If two of the examiners say, no, this is not ready to go forward to defense, it will not go forward to the defense. It's not fair to the student to put them in a situation in which they're um, then yeah, defending a document that two of the examiners, and it only takes two people to refer a thesis, have questions about it. That doesn't happen very often. It happens very infrequently. And when it does, the associate deans do get involved, and we do really recommend to the student that they withdraw the thesis, um, have discussions with the supervisor, make the changes, and then resubmit. But this is, happens 
like so infrequently that I can't imagine that it will happen to any. Has it happened in history in the last? It has not happened in history. It's not happened in history that I've ever been aware of. I think it's more typical. I mean, where it might sometimes happen if the student um, has supervisory relationship issues with their supervisor and says, you think my thesis is rubbish, I think it's great, I'm going forward to defense yeah. even with and, that. And you do have that right, right? You have the right to say, I want to defend this now. Um, and I've been in a situation at RMC once with an MA thesis, and at RMC, the work, when I was doing the lots of MAs, which were thesis MAs, a student said, it's, it's ready to go now, and I said, I don't think it's ready to go now because I, I think you're just going to have really serious problems. Um, it went to defense, and we were very lucky it was referred. It's yeah, the only one I've ever been in that situation. It's there. risky. So if this, ha if this would happen, what I would suggest is that you approach it as a supervisor student issue that needs to be resolved at the local level, so you follow the usual apparatus, which is to speak to your supervisor. If you don't get anywhere, speak to the grad coordinator. If you don't get anywhere, then it would come up yeah. to the associate dean, who's Kim McCauley. Like this, this, is, this hasn't yeah. happened in any of the humanities departments, but um, actually, I, did, I was involved in one referral in history years and years ago, and it was a student who um, insisted that the thesis go forward to defense when her supervisor said it wasn't ready and it was referred. And she eventually passed, but it was a lot of yeah, it's all, it's, it's, grief. Yeah, and that's what it becomes. Okay, so then, um, so they ticked on the form, yes, this is ready to go forward to defense, and then they write a longer report. Um, and these reports, I'm not, are read at the dissertation, and I'll leave that to others to talk about. Um, the School of Graduate Studies recently introduced um, the possibility that you would get from the examiners that report. In the past, the examiner might give you the report at the defense, say, um, here's a copy of my report after the defense. Um, but we were finding that like, there are sometimes like, great reports. There are a page, a page and a half, really useful information for the monograph. So we have started this process that when um, the School of Grad Studies asks everyone if they're fine with the report being circulated. So that happens automatically after you defend your thesis. You will get a copy of all the examiner reports unless an examiner has said that they prefer for it not to be disclosed. And very, that happens very infrequently. So then you go and defend it. And I won't talk about that because I'm taking up too much time. At the end of the defense, the chairperson says to the committee, what ha what if, which of these three categories does the thesis fit into? And I just want to say a little bit about that. Failed. I have never been involved in a thesis that has failed. I think Monica Corbett, who's a registrar, has been involved with two failed theses in her entire career at Queen's. Which is which going to be like, 25 years. Yeah, she's been here forever. So two failed theses. Um, in all of Queen's. This is not history. This all is. of Queen's. And one was academic integrity issues oh. um, after the like falsification of data, like not, <laughs> not you know, missing quotation marks around something that you paraphrase, like uh, so really heavy duty stuff. So, I mean, the chance of, of failure is very, very, very low. Then there's referred and past. So let me say something about past category. The, a thesis is past if the argument and analysis and research is found to be acceptable for the discipline. So it, um, just so you're clear of what the bar is, it's ex what is considered acceptable to that credential in that discipline. It's not outstanding, it's not stellar, it is acceptable. And there'll be a whole range, right, that, um, that um, uh, flows from that. The past category involves minor modifications as well. It could be as small as typos, like, or, you know, failing to distinguish consistently between the possessive and the plural, like little things like that, um, that annoy examiners, so try to avoid they do. it. Um, <laughs> And, um, but, or it could be the need to look at some more scholarship and add additional footnotes to your thesis that indicate that you've 
looked at these scholars that you might not have had to, it might be um, an additional paragraph in your methodological section that the examiner said, oh, you didn't really explain how you came to identify this um, as the sample that you wanted to investigate. So there are lots of um, minor modifications is a capacious category, and it is used capaciously in the School of Grad Study. So you're given the benef benefit of the doubt, if at all possible, examiners do want to pass and fit changes under minor modifications. If the changes are of a major nature, that um, involves referral. Again, referrals are very, very infrequent. I've been involved in the one referral in the history department in my time here, and that was the student who, who went ahead and submitting without. If the thesis is referred, um, the student has a year, up to a year, to make the changes and to defend the defense and redefense if there is a redefense, has to take place within that calendar year. Some, not always, um, a defense isn't always held. Like, so if the defense was excellent, but the document had some problems, sometimes the committee just says, oh, we'll just identify three people who will make those changes. That happened. I, I know of a few cases of that um, in other departments, non-history departments. Again, I just want to emphasize this is very, very infrequent. And if it does happen, it's not a disaster. It means that the document that you have up, and it's a public document, is a better for those changes and modifications. So if that does happen, don't think this is the end of my academic identity. Um, the document that you produce will be more enhanced. But I just want to be very clear that this happens very infrequently. <laughs> um, OK. <laughs> Um, so just one last thing, and I'm just going to identify it because we might want to talk about it in Q and A rather than me um, talk about this. When you have your defense, you are, um, in order to actually get your degree conferred upon you and to get on the degree list, you need to agree to upload your document to Library and Archives Canada and to Q Space. Now, some people prefer not to do that because they're looking at publication, they're worried that publishers may not want them to upload the thesis in this um, immediately accessible form, so it is possible to get a five-year, up to five-year waiver on uploading your thesis to QSpace. Um, but, but you need to have that waiver in place or signed before you can actually get on the degree list, and I'm happy to take questions about that if there's interest in that later on. And you do not have to bind your thesis even at the end. It's totally optional. Which is unfortunate because it's really nice as the supervisor to get a bound copy of the thesis. Yeah. So, <laughs> any of Jane's students, you've heard it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I will pick up where um, Sandra has sort of, well, no, I'm going to pick up in the middle of where Sandra has, was, was talking about. Not the end of the, pro the, the process, but I think the sort of just be before you walk in the door. Not quite just before. Um, a couple of things I'd like to remind you, you have spent four or five or six years on this project, and in many cases you are the expert when you walk in there. Now, it may not mean that, you, that your examiners are not going to say yes, but, because they invariably will, that's part of what the examination process is all about. But you are the one who is, in most cases, most familiar with the material. You are the one who is more likely to be up to date with the literature than anybody else in that room. Um, they, you know, the other folks in the room are going to be c conscious of other literatures, but, but go in with, um, if your supervisor has said to you, this is really ready to go, you, you want to be, in, you, you, want, you really have merited an element of confidence that, that you've earned, right? And, and that confidence will also come because you do want to be involved in the selection of your committee. You were involved at the beginning, or you will be. Valerie and I are going to be working on this, um, you know, who is on your, your dissertation commission committee. You were involved from that. Those people will be on your examining committee. For some of you, you already have your internal external, right? That outside the history department, but inside the department, the university. That person will be on your committee. The big issue, and, and if they're not, you want to be involved in, and, and your supervisor will probably be asking you, um, so who... Do you know in the university that you think would be useful as the external, uh, uh, external, internal, external, whatever the hell they call it, outside the history <laughs> department, and also the external themselves? A um, couple of things with externals. You want an external who, to some degree, is going to also help 
you'd say it, whatever your aspirations are, further your career. This external is going to be writing letters for you. This external, you're, if you're very lucky, you are going to be able to maintain, you're going to develop, and it's very interesting how quickly it happens, which is one of the reasons why it's so important they're here if they can be. You're actually going to be developing a, research, a, a relationship with them. Um, and every so often you will see that external, or they will send you an email and say, and so how is it going? And you're going to be wanting to, um, so you want to be involved in that process. There are, I hate to say it, nuts and bolts issues about bringing someone in from England is a real problem, financially and in all sorts of ways. Um, and it may actually not be the best unless you actually want jobs in England. Right? Or that, that, that external is going to resonate. And so there are all sorts of factors when you're thinking about who you would like as the external. Your supervisor will also be making suggestions. And it is, Andrew's right, it is the supervisor's decision. But you know, it's somebody you want to think about. Who would you, who would you be excited about talking to your work about? Right? That, that's part of what you're going to be doing in all of this. Um, so you, you've, you've done all this, you've um, you know, handed in the thesis, you're at that six week stage where there's absolutely nothing you can do, right? Nothing you can do but frame. And most of you will, even though you shouldn't. Um, because there is nothing you can do. There is nothing you can do. The worst thing you can do is spend six weeks reading and rereading and rereading and rereading your thesis to make sure that you're really on top of it. And oh my god, I haven't read the latest book that's come out, and what am I, I've got to include it. No, you don't. No, you don't. At most, in that six-week process, you should do no more than reread your thesis once. <coughs> and if you can't reread your thesis, I'm serious, right? You know it. You are familiar with it. Um, you are. You know how you, you know, you've developed your arguments and all that kind of thing. One thing it is worthwhile doing is sitting down with your supervisor, who will go over the whole process again with you, I'm sure, but also begin to identify. And I mean, something that, that I've certainly done, and I know when I did my, uh, uh, and I forgot about that, but I did my exam, and I'll tell you about it in a minute. Um, but identify questions that you would like to answer. Mm -hmm. Now, for me, there are some pretty standard ones. Tell me about the strengths and weaknesses of your sources, whatever your sources are, right? That's a pretty standard question you're always going to get. And there are strengths and weaknesses in all our sources. Um, how has your thesis changed from the time you started to where you ended up? They always have, right? Somewhere along the line. And why do you think it's changed? Um, if you, where do you think your thesis is going to go from here, right? So where, where, do, where do you, where, where, what areas would you like to have had more time, energy, whatever, to develop more? Um, standard question: Where do you, where do you fit in these conversations that you're part of, right? You know, where, what are you contributing? It's very basic questions, um, but. Actually think about them and identify them. And in, if the examiners themselves don't bring it up, your supervisor, that's one of the things your supervisor can do is bring those up at the exam. Right? And there, there, and there are all sorts of other questions that you can think about that you might like to discuss, that you might like to, to play with. So you're going to walk into the exam itself. And I would suggest you walk in with a copy of the thesis, some paper, and a pencil. That's what you're going to walk in with. The reason you want the paper and the pencil is, is that you want to be able to have something to write down questions, right? It's worth it. Um, you're going to walk in. You're going to be introduced to everybody. You're probably going to have met them anyway before. It's a very weird, I mean, it, it's just a bizarre process. <laughs> you walk in. We say, how do you do? And you do the da 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 And then they say, OK, now you can leave. That's literally, <laughs> I'm serious. That's literally what happens. You go outside, you go somewhere, and we say to you, don't go too far. Um, you know. <laughs> Don't laugh. It's, not, it's true. And then we, i.e. the committee, sits down and we read the reports, literally. Uh, it starts, the chair will have all the reports in hand. We read the reports and we read them in the order of questioning officially. So it starts with the external, uh, internal, external, internal, heads, delegate, supervisor. That's it, right? Uh, we read them. And then there is... And that takes a long time. You've got to assume, <laughs> no, no, I, so some people will write two paragraphs, half a page. Some people will write three pages, single spaced. Right? Three pages, single spaced is 10 minutes of, 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 right? If it was double spaced, it was six. So this is 10 minutes of one report. 
And it's interesting because I've often thought that what we should be doing is turning to people and saying, give me a report to be read, which covers everything, provide a report for the candidate and the, the supervisor, which includes all of that detail about page 63, or the in the future, I think you should be looking at X, Y, and Z. So these were, there, there's, no, there's no limit on how much people can, should, or should not write. Some people will write a sentence. Um, so you've got to assume that you've got 10 to 15 minutes of sitting outside. So uh, the other thing to bring is bring some water or something, <laughs> but go to the washroom first before you walk back in. I, I know it sounds silly, but it's a good thing to do, folks. You can't get up in the middle, right? Once we're in the room, we are officially in the room till it's done. You're not, because you actually get to leave again. Um, so at that, that sort of round table, we discuss reports. Um, People may, in most cases, we turn around and at that point we all sort of smile at each other and say, well, this is going to be quite fun. Um, because everything's fine, right? There are some issues and we may have identified some really key issues, but everything is fine. There may be a situation, and I've been in this twice in, you don't want to know how long I've been teaching, almost 30 years, um, where one person thought there were some issues, not really serious issues, but some issues that they really wanted to get into and are perhaps going to want some revisions. And then there'll be some discussion at that. So as you can see, this, this sort of round table discussion can take some time. It's hard for you. I know it's hard for you. The way that the, the, the process is set up, that can't be done in advance of you because you've got to have met everybody. And that's just the way it goes. But it is pretty, it's pretty unnerving. And I certainly knew it was unnerving for me. I mean, I don't remember a whole lot about my thesis defense. <laughs> um, but I remember being outside, and it was a blur, and going, and then getting in, and my external, who I actually knew from before, um, he was one of my undergraduate professors, as a matter of fact, who thought the whole thing was funny, and he kept saying, Jane, that's not the case. And of course, one of the advantages I have that many of you don't have is that I was actually older when I got to this stage. And so I just got stroppy, I think. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. um, but that, but I can remember that sort of, that, that you know, the pity of your stomach as you walk in the room, that sort of goes, oh, shit, that man, what have I got myself into now? Um, but you, so you'll come back, the chair or somebody will ask you to come back to the room. And at that point, and in fact, you should have made this decision before, there are two basic formats that can happen in thesis defense. The first is the formal for process where you go around a room and you start with the external, and this is always the same order, external, internal, external, uh, internal, department head, um, supervisor, and, that, and each, everybody's given a certain amount of time. That can be modified, however, and this is in part your decision as well as usually the chair's decision if you are willing to have and, or if you are comfortable having interruptions. So there's Kendall down here saying, okay, she's the external and she turns around and says, da -da 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 -da. and Sandra here is the candidate who answers and Jane as the outsider go, as, as the internal outsider goes, yes, but what about? Now I'm taking up 25 minutes or some of that, but that's a different format and part of it's gonna depend on what you're comfortable with. I personally prefer the second one because it tends to lead to discussion more than just a sort of straight inquisition questioning. Um, but many people are not comfortable with that and that's fine. Uh, you do have to recognize that after that interruption we'd be going back to the external and saying, okay, carry on. But, but some, some chairs and some candidates don't like that at all. They don't want the interruptions. So it's one thing you want to think about excuse me, talk to your supervisor about, um, be conscious of that, all right? Because that will be something that you should be asked at the beginning. You'll then go through a whole series, you know, you'll go through the, the five or whatever it is, people. Um, and a couple of general things when you're thinking about it. The reason you've got this bit of paper and pencil is that <laughs> some examiners are very long-winded, right? They will sort of ask, Multi, you know, multi-part questions. Um, some, most, not every, this is not everybody. Of course, it's never me. Um, but well, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> they will ask multi-part questions, or they will ask questions in a way that you actually are not sure what they want. So you want to do two things. Do not be afraid to ask 
Do you, are you asking me about this or this? Right? You are, that is your responsibility because you've got to ask, answer the question that they want you to ask, not the one you'd like to ask. <laughs> That's not the gig here. You don't get to talk about what you, I mean, you may eventually when your supervisor gets to be here, but you are answering the question that they are asking. And if you're not sure what that question is, find out. Right? If it's a multi-part question, it's worth spending going around and going one, to, as they're asking it, two, three, or after they've asked it, take that 30 seconds and just write down what you think those three parts are. And then go through them. Okay. And if you forget one of them, it's fine to say... I, 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 th I think I've forgotten one. <laughs> what, what was the third thing you wanted me to do? Okay. Um, and it is actually worth... You know, don't be afraid to ask, and, but remember that you're asking the question that is asked, not the question. You, we've, you've all done some marking now, right? <laughs> you've all had those students who turn around and look at a test at the thing, and, and their answer has got nothing to do with the question. Nothing. And by right, you fail, because they haven't answered the question that asked. Well, you don't want to be in that kind of position. Um, the other thing that, that I think that you want to be conscious of is, and it's very, really worth spending some time with your supervisor before you walk into the exam, what are issues that you want to make sure that come up at the, at the exam, that if nobody else talks about it, your supervisor is going to bring it up. That's part of the job of the supervisor. Um, and in many cases, the exam will start in one of two ways. Sometimes the chair will ask the first question. Officially, that's what the chairs are supposed to do. They're supposed to make you feel comfortable. Well, you're not going to feel comfortable, <laughs> right? I mean, it's a silly thing to do. But, but nonetheless, some chairs do it. Some do, some, some do not. Um, but often, and if nobody else does it, your supervisor will do it, they'll turn around and say, is there anything else you think we should know about this? Or is there anything else that should be happening with this? Or you know, what excites you about this, or something um, to allow you to end on a note, which is your note. This is your work, right? You are proud of your work. Um, you get to show off your work. That's part of what you're doing here. You're going, look at me, boys. I'm pretty good at this. And you are. You wouldn't be there. You're not sitting at that table unless you're in that position. And so you want to be able to enjoy that process. Now, enjoy is maybe the wrong word. Because um, I hate to say it, what you then do at the end of that process is you leave again. <laughs> you literally go out the door. And we say, don't go far. And we go around the table and we take the three, we have those three things that, that Sandra pointed out, passed, referred, failed. Um, and often chairs will say, anybody going with fail, nobody goes with fail. Anybody <laughs> going with referred, I've been on two that have been referred, one here and one at RMC. Um, anybody goes with passed. Now, even with the ones that are passed, it's not unusual for someone to say, yes, it's a really good thesis, but I would like them to do X, Y, and Z. It is the chair's responsibility, and to some degree, your supervisor's responsibility, but officially the chair, to actually note all those things down. So, I say pass, but I would like you to um, add a footnote about this, and I really wonder about the language you've used here, and of course you've got to, you know, clear up all the typos, and, and typos are a real pain, by the way, in grammatical mistakes, so get somebody to proofread your material. There's nothing more distracting than reading stuff that's just full of stuff, and it does happen. Um, what will happen is, you will then be told, okay, yes, it's passed, but you've got to do X, dick, 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 and there'll be a list of them. And before your thesis is finally submitted, your, your supervisor must attest to the fact that you've made the corrections as noted. Right? I will write a note, or Sandra will write a note, or one, somebody will write a note which says, yes, this thesis meets these, or I don't remember the word we use, but it's something. And I actually sign my name, and it goes in with the final submission. Now, the other thing is, the grad school is going to send you a template. If you don't make the template, and most of us don't make the templates, <coughs> and the template's pretty, I mean, it's like you've got to be within a millimeter of the, the, the bloody margins, and you know, you haven't done it in one and a half, you've done it in two and a half, spacing, whatever it is. But grad school will also tell you, by the way, this and this and this and this are wrong in your formatting, <laughs> right? 
Mm-hmm. Don't they? Oh yeah. Did that happen to you? Um, I think Rose had some minor corrections. Yeah, there. and and there will be minor, but you've got to do them. Yes. Right. My advice to you is that you're, you'll then get to come out of this. Everyone else congratulate you. Hopefully, take you to dinner, which is part of the gig, right? You get a free dinner and drinks out of this. Um, you will then gather. At that point, you will have gathered everybody's thesis, a uh, copy. And I suggest that what you do is you sit down with your copy and their copies, and you just transpose everything to one copy and make your corrections. It should be quick and dirty, right? This is not, you are not rewriting your thesis. You are not editing your thesis. That is for what comes next when you're preparing stuff for publications. What you're doing at this stage is you're saying on page two, line three, I need the instead of a. And this copy says, yes, but on line four, we also need a comma. So you go, you've got them all out there somewhere. You do this, and you put them all to one thing. You put in your corrections, and you say it's done. You write to your supervisor and say, here's the final copy. Send it to them electronically in most cases, unless, of course, you're not going to give them a bound copy, in which case you better give them a hard copy, which you're mean. Um, and, um, and then you're going to get it in. Right? The supervisor is going to say, yes, all the corrections have been right, made as noted, and you're done. So it's at that point that you're done. But that last stage, this really is a quick and dirty stage. This is not I want to rewrite. And I've had one student who turned to me and said, yes, but I really don't like this chapter. <laughs> and I said to him, I don't care whether you don't like the chapter at this point. That's not the issue here. The issue here is this is what was examined. This is what they said was fine. You make the corrections and get them in. If you want to now rewrite that chapter because it's going to get published by somebody, <laughs> go for it. But that's not the exam. It's, um, it's a trying process. It's an exhilarating process. You'll come out of the exam and you'll think, so now what do I do? <laughs> like I've just spent four years of my life researching and writing. Now what do I do? Well, it, if nothing else, you take a break. Um, and then you go off and play and you do various other things. But it is a... Um, it can be exhilarating, it's a bit terrifying. I don't think there's anybody in the history department who would, who would condone any of you going to a defense who they did not think was ready for. Mm-hmm. Right? That's part of what my job is as a supervisor, is to be able to say, yes, this thesis is ready for defense. Right? Yes, this thesis meets the standard. There's a standard phrase that most of us use at the beginning of our reports. Jane Arrington's thesis on whatever meets the requirements for a PhD in history. That's the standard format that you start, and then you go on and you say, really interesting stuff, da 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 I wonder about. Because right? those reports will also include your data series of questions. Anyway, I've talked enough. Now, you can tell us what you thought of the whole process. <laughs> um, I think I'm, I'm going to quickly start Um, from this point that Professor Arrington made about being ready. And I think it's really important to know that you are going into a defense because you're ready (laughs) and because your supervisor thinks you're ready, uh, which I didn't feel at all when I was going into a defense. (laughs) Um, But uh, for just very quickly for um, preparing before the defense, I... Um, had that six week window. I only had six weeks uh, from the time I submitted um, to, th- to my defense. Um, and what I did was for the first couple of, well, first three and a half weeks, didn't think about it at all. I was so yeah, yeah. exhausted from the process of writing and su- submitting that I took, com- took complete time off of uh, thinking about the defense. And then it was only about two weeks um, Till, till the defense and I kind of got a little freaked out and, and, <laughs> <laughs> and I thought I should start preparing. And again, um, my preparation was mostly just reading my thesis uh, once and, and anticipating what kind of questions uh, I could be asked. Um, I know a, a colleague, a friend of mine who um, has defended recently, who um, very, was much more organized than I am and did something really cool. Um, which is she divided categories of questions that could be asked. So there was um, questions from each chapter, uh, questions by theme, uh, questions by committee members. Um, wow. I know, I was so impressed when I, when I saw that, that sort of folder she had. Um, and what, what is, oh, I think 
important to do is if you're not aware of what each committee member has worked on in their own uh, in their own research uh, already to familiarize yourself mm -hmm. with what, what their work is, especially at the external who will spend most time talking with you, um, so that you can again anticipate where they're coming from, what interests them and what kind of uh, approach um, they would take. Um, and finally, for a pre-prep, uh, pre-defense prep, I would say rehearse, maybe with friends, a couple of introductory uh, questions, some general questions that are always asked about methodology, about, um, you know, um, the, or, or just even the introductions. For me, um, I'm generally a nervous person and I, I get very unnerved with uh, interacting with people I don't know or generally public speaking. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, so it, it would, I, I, I kept rehearsing in my head, going in there and saying, you know, greeting everyone, and it was it was good to know uh, Professor Denata had had already given me the picture of what was going to happen. I would walk in, say hello to everyone, and leave. Uh, <laughs> so it, it was it was good to know that this was the structure. The waiting time is just so unnerving, but um, it was um, it, it you know so it it it's a good idea to maybe have a. a a, a sheet of paper where you have certain things noted down, or if you don't want to look look at or think about the, because you're already prepared, right? You're ready when you're in there. So maybe you can even have a have a book that you really like with you that calms you down to read when you're waiting. Uh, and this is also part of the the preparation for defense. I would suggest is is to uh, remember and do things that calm you down. Like I would uh, treat myself to hot chocolate like <laughs> every day for the three days leading up to the defense. Or, um, you know, watch particular series that calm. Anything that keeps the anxiety levels low. Because it's really the anxiety that gets in the way of a good defense experience. Um, and uh, as has been pointed out earlier, you already know your thesis more than any, I mean, you know it much more deeply than anyone else does. So uh, it's, it's really about uh, taking the best out of that, ex that experience. And there are, this is possibly the last time you'll have six or five people who will sit down and pay that much attention to such a big uh, pro project that mm -hmm. you've done and give their insights and their you know, feedback. So I kept reminding myself that this is not about me performing really well, but taking away really good feedback, which again didn't really help my nervousness. I was, I, no matter what I did, I was still very nervous. So um, I would just say that, yeah, just kind of knowing and being aware of the, of of the 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 uh, different uh, committee members and their works is is probably a uh, good way to uh, prepare oneself. And my fears, if they materialized or not, this is some, some of the pointer, pointers I got from Emily about what I should talk about. Um, yes, they did, which is that I felt like I would be really nervous. I wasn't as much, uh, I think, afraid about answering questions as just freezing and being really uh, just in a, in a blur. And it was mm -hmm. like that. I, feel like I, it was this out of body experience. I kept thinking, my heart is beating really fast. It shouldn't beat really fast. <laughs> why, is, why am I not calm? Instead of really just relaxing and, and having those conversations. Um, just for the record, none of this was visible. I was at this <laughs> <difference>. <laughs> um, It was, I had the more formal defense where each person, each professor uh, took about uh, 20 to 30 minutes, well, less than that, actually, about 20 minutes to, to um, ask questions, starting with the external. Um, and I, I, I think I, I liked that aspect of it because I felt like I could just focus on one person and I couldn't I, I tell myself this is the only, this is the person I'm having the conversation with. Uh, but uh, then again, uh, what happens is 
sometimes you may not get asked the questions you think will be asked. I thought A, B, and C things were really compelling about my thesis, but someone can ask me something that is the, the least compelling thing for me, or something that I thought was really, really unimportant. And that could take up a lot of time. Um, so the unpredictability of it is something also I think we should be aware of. We cannot really control what happens in there. But just to, um, and, and it's fine, like, I'd, after, after the defense, you don't really, after uh, a couple of weeks, you don't really care. <laughs> 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 um, so I think we've gone over what the structure of, of that is. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to go on over that more. But yes, have pen, paper, and, and water ready. And it was also good advice for me to know that I could, w when once the question was asked, think about it mm -hmm. um, you know, for, for a while, drink water, move around a bit. I remember you telling me that. Uh, to move around in my chair to just get the blood circulating and like realizing that I'm, you know, moving. I'm, you know, I'm kind of alive. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, answer. I, I felt like answering the questions as directly as possible was was a great uh, sort of is a good way to go. Uh, but that said, sometimes, like I said, the questions can be really tangential to what you've really, you know, kind of written about. Um, and so you can, I feel like, direct. Uh, answer the question directly and then mm -hmm. move on to saying mm -hmm. what you think mm -hmm. is more important uh, in your work. Mm -hmm. So you can always add things to that, you know, kind of answer, even if it's not directly asked. Um, and tie in those aspects of the thesis that you love. So if you get a chance to talk about those things about your thesis that you really love, do it. And because that makes the conversation a lot, a uh, lot better. Um, and you can always, I guess, ask again, like, can you rephrase that? Can you kind of change, you know, can you rephrase what, what you just said? Or can you clarify what you mean by uh, what you said? Um, what would I do differently about, about my, uh, I think all of the above, all the things that I've been talking about, <laughs> I, would, um, I would prepare, I would make myself a lot calmer. I don't know how to, one so would yeah, do, how that. Do, you do that. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, just uh, prepare with friends and I think it's, it's uh, this is a great way to, I think, for everyone to, mm -hmm. to talk mm -hmm. about it, get to know what it's really like. And so things like that, I wish I had this before I, I defend it. Uh, um, and, um, and yeah, so what I would like to impress upon students is something that's been said before again, is that you're in there because you're ready and you know your thesis the best and kind of highlight what you love about, about your thesis. I think I'll end there. Great, thank you so much. <laughs>
40 rooms, which are actually better. Your um, supervisor can yeah. decide that's where it is. I was also able to kind of um, email Yvonne and make my preference um, kind of clear. I wanted to have it at the room next to hers where I had my proposal defense. And just because the space was familiar, the, or the walls were orange and, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and several other things. So I, I was, I wanted to there. know the space yeah. that, yeah, so that. Interesting. Interesting. Um, Dia? Is it about the document or about your performance when you're actually in the room? What? <laughs> it's a really, really good question. So um, the language um, right now is thesis and its defense. Um, I recently went through that document and took out any incident of the word performance because it, it, it is a defense and it's an oral defense, but if we think about it as a, a performance, then I think it kind of tilts what we see as the purpose of that. The purpose of the defense is to give the student an opportunity to articulate the underlying assumptions, methodology, um, defend the, the findings and the conclusions and be able to set it in a, a larger context. Um, I don't think that's a performance necessarily. Some people might make it a performance, but that's not the ultimate standard. Does that, like, is it safe to think of it as like, an honest conversation about your thesis, or should it be, I guess when I hear defense, I think I should be talking about the cause of I should be trying to yeah. push it, or can I sort of admit the... Yeah, that's a really good question. I'll say something and then I think yeah. it would be great to, I, it is a defense. So I think that you, it, it's a very, to calibrate that balance is a really key one so that you want to be open to the insights of your examiners who come at your subject from a variety of different um, scholarly perspectives at the same time as defending it so that in terms of scope or the underlying methodologies that yes, you know this well, you are the expert but you need to calibrate. You can't be defensive. You can't, you were stroppy, but I don't know if everyone else would get, <laughs> get through with it, um, get away with that. Um, but yeah, you, you do need to be confident, but not arrogant, and accepting of changes, but holding your ground. It's, it's about But holding your ground, I think, does mean that you can turn around and say that these were the parameters. And you're right, I might in fact have included this, but at this point, these are the parameters that I'm writing about, right? Mm -hmm. Or um, things like somebody brings up a question of, so why didn't you look at X, Y, and Z? And you can say, well, given where I was going with this, um, it just, it wasn't gonna work. It's something that has to be added later, mm -hmm. right? Right, this is, this is where I think mm -hmm. I might be going in the future. And you may well have set some of that up in your introduction. Most of us, when we write, actually turn around somewhere in, the, in the, the first couple of pages and say, so this is what I'm writing about. And then there's this note which says, however, I am not considering ding, 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 ding. Right? The caveats. Yeah, the caveats. Mm -hmm. And most of us include that anyway. And so somebody's invariably going to say to you, well, you should have included that. And you said, no, no, I don't. The scope yes. of this is this. It's not this plus. Mm -hmm. Right? Does that help? What would you say? Yes, I, I completely agree. I think uh, it's it's a balance um, of um, you know uh, looking confident and sounding confident and, and being confident. Being confident, yes. <laughs> <laughs> being confident. Um, and also uh, defending uh, and there, thereby defending what you've uh, produced and be kind of expressing that there are strategic decisions you have to make when you're writing a thesis and you have the amount of time you have um, and that you can't write about every possible tangent that, that it could take. Yeah. So. Pamela? Actually, I just wanted to, to add something that my supervisor told me before my defense I found helpful in terms of the, was it, you know, mostly writing or your performance last night? Certainly Sanders already answered it, but um, Karen had said to me, you know, when you're coming in, all your the people on the panel have their, are going to be passing or, or not at that point. And what your defense allows is not so much that they're going to decide, oh, now we better not pass you. But if they were on the fence, you might persuade them, you know, to instead of not passing, now you just need to make a change and edit. You know, instead of being a wholehearted, like, which is really going to happen. Right? So it's your chance to, like, improve <laughs> their opinion of your work as opposed to, like, as opposed to the opposite way. 
and that sort of made me feel a little bit better about the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, Allison? I have two questions. One's really silly, but one's really serious. What do you wear to defenses? <laughs> like, I know it sounds silly, but I don't... It, it would, it, this is going to be one of my biggest worries. <laughs> Yeah, if you care about, I think what makes you feel really comfortable and good, like it's, it definitely adds to the, the how you feel about, um, you know, walking in there and, and things like that. So I, I mean, it's realistic. It's a very realistic question. I think all of us think about I'm sure that. So I don't, I don't think any of the committee members care about it at all. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, it's. And then my serious question is, what happens if you end up with someone who's combative in the defense? I've only ever heard of it happening once, and I don't think my supervisor would put me in a position where that would happen, but it really, I get quite defensive and also sometimes cry when people are me. <laughs> and I don't want to do that. So what would, how um, would you... You mean sort of challenging you, saying, no, you're wrong, that kind of thing? No, people who like are just not, not there to help you in a positive way, and seem to have like an ultimate agenda, perhaps. <laughs> um, oh, that's interesting. So part of that, you first are hoping to forestall based on, no, I'm serious. Um, your supervisor and you know about personality issues, right? There are going to be personality issues, either folks within the university or bringing in someone else. Um, the combativeness, part of it, I think, depends on, on, I've only been in two where this was a real issue. Um, both of which worked. Uh, the first one, the supervisor intervened and said, really interesting ideas, but that's not where we're going with this. And that worked, that was the best one that worked. The other one it was the candidate, the student, tried to actually go head on head initially, and that did not work initially. Uh, and then everybody pulled back. Um, I think probably your supervisor would intervene. I think that at that point, too, you've got to be able to say, you know, yes, they're, they're not being combative. And you can say, like, I don't understand where you're going. Uh, I don't understand how this pertains to X, Y, and Z. Are there other areas that we can get into? Um, you, in part, your supervisor is there to support you. Yeah, I don't think. That and I can't imagine <laughs> any of you being in the position where a supervisor would let that go. I can't imagine it, and I may be wrong, um, but I don't think I could imagine it. And every so often it does get struck. I mean, people do. When I, when I say getting struck, I actually knew, I knew him relatively well, so we just laughed about it. Anyway. Peter? I guess a somewhat related question to Allison's. Um, just in terms of the process of selecting an external, I know you said it's ultimately the supervisor's problem or decision to make. You gave some good advice about things to consider in terms of using that person and so forth. But is it wise to have an external who you, for example, cite extensively or perhaps interrogate their work and sort of <laughs> be in your dissertation? Or do you want someone who's more kind of thematically related? Or um, how close should that person, that scholar, be to your actual work? Hmm, interesting yeah. question. Mm -hmm. What would you mm -hmm. say? Um, what, what would be the concern of having somebody who's, who is very closely? Are you, are you linking it to the combative? Well, I just, in the sense that you're, Studying that person extensively and perhaps maybe criticizing some of their uh, published work. So I don't know if that's a, if that yeah. maybe perhaps a good thing. And th that's, I think, where you use the supervisors, that it does become yeah. an issue in terms of, uh, of supervisors. So Personality, because it can be an excellent opportunity for dialogue, right? Yeah. And that's what a, a good defense should be. But, and most scholars are reasonable people who are interested in having their own work interrogated and discussed. But you would want to make sure that the person fell into that category of yeah. a reasonable person rather than somebody who had any big issues that, were, that would be flagged. Your supervisor would flag that. Mm -hmm. I, I think the other, sorry, just to go back to your point about who is useful for you in terms of writing letter, if that scholar is a well-known um, scholar in the field who you can imagine writing supportive letters, think ahead to the letters and the endorsement of your career, whatever you do, whether it's in academia or beyond. Yeah. That's really critical. Dina? Um, I feel anxiety to break my project on a regular basis. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm sure, well, you can, you might. <laughs> yes, no, I think we all do. Um, 
And it seems like a really basic and silly question, but what in the Lord's name happens if you don't know the answer to the question? You say, I don't Is know. Is it possible to just say, I don't know, yep. and try and recover later on? Or, because I feel like when I'm in my teaching a class and a student asks me a question, you know what, I don't know the answer. Can I uh, look that up and I will get back to you in 24 hours? I can't do that. No, but you can't say I don't know. Yeah. And I think you, you I, and two things. You may not know because you think it's a really silly question, right? So, um, let me give. so esoteric that I have no idea what you're talking about. And that's, and, and at which point you want to turn around and say, I really don't understand what you're talking about or what you would like to do. Can, can you, so, can you rephrase? That's the rephrase question. Um, but the other one is that you may get someone, and I've seen this in a defense, I actually run into it all the time when I speak to community groups, and you're talking about some, something and they turn around and say, yes, but on the 27th of April of 1812, <laughs> Mrs. Smith did X. So why did Mrs. Smith did X? And you have no idea who Mrs. Smith is, let alone what she did and why she did it, right? At which point you say, I really don't know. Right? So that kind of very detailed, and every so often you will get an examiner who will do that, that kind of very detailed, at which point you're going, I don't give a shit. <laughs> right? You can't say that. But you can say, I really don't know. Um, you know, and, and you can say, so what is it? And ask them. That's one way of doing it. Or I really don't know, and I don't know quite how it would fit into whatever. Um, but if it's a question where you actually don't understand it, and sometimes that happens, um, you can say, I, I, I just, I'm not sure what you're getting at. I'm not sure what you mean. I'm not sure where you want to go with this. Can you explain? Well, I know that going into, into the defense, like the, the, the professors there are like, gotcha, ha ha. No, I don't, I realize that yeah. people are there to have a, a good discussion yep. with you about your project. Uh, just, yeah, is there any room for, say, like you had mentioned, maybe the last question the chair might say is, do you have anything else you want to talk about? Maybe at that point you've recovered or you can have a couple of guesses. Yeah, and, and I think by saying you don't know, you haven't fallen into an abyss, yeah. right? You don't need to recover. Okay. You yeah. don't think about it as yeah. recovering. Yeah. One of the things as historians, you folks are all way too young. <laughs> I've done this long enough that I now know that I don't know most stuff, right? When I was at your stage, I assumed that I at least knew some stuff. Now I know I don't know most stuff. Um, and so you can quite legitimately say, I don't know. Or isn't that really fascinating? I wonder where that would take us. Or, you know, I hadn't thought about that. That's a really good way to, that, I, that I'll have to think about it and figure out where it's going to fit. Right? And, and that's not a failure to do that. That is not a failure to do that. That's an openness. That's a, I don't have to be defensive about this. That's just one of the many things that would be added to this, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you for the uh, presentation. It was really, really helpful. Um, though I'm more kind of the beginning of the PhD students. But Rita, this question was for you. I don't know if anyone asked it, but was there something that occurred during the defense that you like really did not expect and or did you kind of feel like most of the things were things that you kind of prepared yourself mentally prior to walking in? Um, there, there was one question that off the top of my head that I didn't <laughs> expect at all um, which was I mean and, and it was about you know um, uh, someone uh, one my external asked me to explain how I ha what you know this this big critique I'm offering for for uh, an author or or in some intervention, and I had no idea I was doing that in my thesis. <laughs> so that that was really interesting because if sometimes you're so close to your own work that you may not know you know in what what ways people read it. Um, so that that was one. Uh, for sure, but recently um, I was talking to a friend of mine who defended, and she she found that uh, she had an elaborate pre preparation done with questions of like the categories I was talking about, and she found that she was asked something, and the, the, a lot of the conversation was about something that she felt was really not, uh, you know, her her focus or her. 
something she paid attention to. It's quite unpredictable. It can be, even if a lot of preparation goes into it. So I guess one has to take it, just go with the flow. <laughs> Sure. Is, 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 is this, I have a voice every time I ask you this. I've worked for uh, 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 a master's defense, and it's Jane's voice, actually. Because uh, <laughs> the one thing that you mentioned, but it was the first thing that when I stepped into Jane's on my committee that she said to me, actually, that you probably don't remember, is Michelle, remember to breathe. Yeah, remember to breathe, yes. Yes, remember to breathe. And I mean, it's the kind of thing that I usually tell my students as well, because when you're caught up in that initial presentation or you're caught up in even the answering, it's amazing how that actual physical process of thinking and going, I'm going to breathe right now, actually allows you to sort of formulate how you're going to answer a question or even just clear your head. And it's amazing how many people forget to breathe. Um, and you can sort of see that initially you get in there and you're nervous and you just sort of plow through things. And then you sort of, you know, suffer from oxygen deprivation. <laughs> and then you sort of hit a little bit of a low. But, uh, any final questions? Emily? Yeah, this is a really simple question, but from the moment we walk in to do our introductions and then are kicked out again to the moment when we come back and you give the final verdict, are we talking three, four hours, no. two hours? Two, two, two and, and a half. half. Yeah. Thank you. That's really good. I'm adding up in my head. <laughs> yeah. Three would be a long one. Okay. Three yeah. would be quite long. And it, it, you have all, you're all teaching now at some point. When was the last time you sat still completely for three hours? I can't do it in my own seminars. Well, can you? Right? Nobody is good after two, an hour, two hours. Nobody is good after two hours. It just becomes this, right? And so there's no point for you, for anybody else. It's just too tiring. So two and a half, that would include the outs and ins. And One last question? Anyone? No? Okay, well, on that note, um, let's all get up from our seats so we're not sitting <laughs> too long. And we've got a 15 minute break. And thanks again to the